Now by our Monday regular from the Bob McCowan podcast, John Shannon joins us here on Sikaris and Price. Mr. Shannon, how are you, sir? I'm great, Blake. Hi, Jeff. Hi, John. It was uh, it was a busy hockey weekend, believe it or not. You know, as the July 16, 17 weekend often is for the NHL, uh, there was trades. Uh, teams still attending to things. They didn't just... Uh, you know, take off after the first couple of days of free agency. No, and and I, I suspect that uh, uh, as much as we all would like to have some time off, I I, I suspect that teams are uh, in the mode of trying to make sure that they have a bit of space between where they are and the cap, so they're going to try to manage it. I I think I think we're going to see this all summer long. I really do. You know, I, I was I was talking to a couple of teams on the weekend, and and both of them unsolicited said the same thing is we're just going to wait. We're going to wait and do our business. You know, um, you know, right now teams can be 10% over the 82 five or whatever it is. Uh, but everybody wants to manage their cap situation. And, and I think that they still think there are a couple of bargains out there, uh, to sign for particularly depth forward. So it, it's, a it's really, uh, uh, an interesting time. The Pittsburgh trade to me, I didn't realize John Marino was a five-time Norris Trophy winner with all the discussion about him all this time <laughs> because there's, <laughs> there's, there's been tons of talk about him. Uh, I was a Matt, I'm a, I'm a Mike Matheson fan. I always was. I liked him in Florida. I thought he I thought he learned a lot in Pittsburgh. I think he'll be great in Montreal. Um, and I can't believe that the Devils gave up on Ty Smith that quickly. And that to me, uh, comparable to the Kirby Doc thing in Chicago. Giving up on, you know, high picks this early just doesn't make any sense to me. I didn't realize Jeff Petrie had been in Montreal for eight years. Like, it feels like, I don't know, it feels like a handful. Eight years in uh, in Montreal. Um, and, you know, he says that he can still be a good player. He says he just hasn't been happy personally. So he's seen this as a new lease on life, but 34-year-old. And um, with Pittsburgh involved all weekend long, I don't know that they've necessarily solved much of their glut of defensemen. Do you think they're done? No, no. I, as I said, I don't. I don't think. I think Ron Hextall, like the other thirty-one guys, I, I think that they're going to juggle all summer. I think they're going to try to tweak and uh, and and pick away at their own cap issues and and find ways to move a couple of players around. Columbus has to do the same thing after the Johnny Hockey signing. Um, so I, I think that we're going to see a lot of this, you know, I don't want to call it a shell game cause it's not a shell game, but these, these constant trades of, you know, maybe a draft pick here or a, a prospect there for someone to help a team, uh, get in a more manageable cap situation. I think it's going to happen all summer long. Right. So let's bring that closer home to home here in Vancouver. When you see what Edmonton had to pay to move Zach Cassian at the draft, and then last week you see Vegas essentially give Max Pacioretty away, but, uh, oh yeah, they also had to send Carolina an additional piece to make that happen. John, do you think the Canucks can shed salary this offseason without adding a sweetener of some kind? Well, do they have to? Shed salary? Yeah. Yes. Uh, um... Yeah, I mean, they're they're over the cap right now, so yeah. they have to get compliance somehow, some way. And it just feels like, it feels to me that if they, you know, if, if they could have, they probably would have moved Tanner Pearson or Jason Dickinson, or maybe even Tyler Myers by now. And yet all three of those players remain on the roster. And I just wonder if they're going to be like teams know they're up against it. So nobody's going to do them a favor. Uh, (laughs) So I just wonder if they're going to have to attach a sweetener to, by, to get the, out of this. By the way, uh, I, I know t- people in Vancouver love to hear this. Throw Toronto into that, who, you know, they had to ransom a few draft picks to get rid of Peter Morazic, right? Um, uh, so yeah, the answer is, I mean, Jeff, yes. Um, but I, I also think that um, our friends, Mr. Elveen and Mr. Rutherford, have one asset they think that if they – if they are going to move him, they can probably move one of those other guys with him, and that's J.T. Miller. I'm not suggesting that. I mean, I, I'm I'm one of those guys. I think I've probably been pretty consistent on this. I wouldn't move Miller. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't move him under any circumstances. I think there, and I think there are people in the organization starting to feel that they shouldn't move him uh, because he's that valuable a player. And then they're going to have to find a way to get him on a long-term deal and not lose him, like the Flames lost Goudreau. 
Um, but it, it, that's why that's why all these guys have been trying to over the last couple of years, or particularly the last year, is to try to build their bank of draft picks up and assets up that way and prospects in order to try to pay off these situations. You know, will you take a Myers? Will you take a Pearson? Uh, and yeah, okay. What's that worth to you? Is that, can we give you a third round pick with it? So I, I, I you know, if, if that's what they have to do, then they're going to have to do it. But I also think that they might try to bundle something, um, in, in order to try to help someone else out uh, and then take a little bit of the pressure off the cap for the Canucks. Well, somewhere, somewhere, JT Miller, I'm sure, is watching Nazem Kadri and his situation. Is it, uh, I don't know, is it unfolding? <laughs> At some point, it's going to. We know that uh, you mentioned Johnny Hockey and the way that the market sort of moved a little bit for him. Do you think the delay in this decision makes it at all more plausible that Kadri returns to the Avs? Uh, I, I think that's possible. But then again, uh, what does Colorado have to do to become cap compliant right. then too? Yeah. And so, so when, when the Stanley cup champions are in this boat, everybody's in the boat. Um, and not everybody can trade with San Jose and Arizona. <laughs> so, um, it, it's one of those things, Jeff, where you look at it and say, I, I mean, I, I could see, uh, Nas going back. Um, but you know what, Chris McFarland now and, and Joe Sackick have to do something in order to try to, to make that palatable. As soon as, as soon as Lekkonen signed his deal. As soon as that deal for our Terry Lekkonen occurred, you knew that Kadri was in trouble in, in Colorado and then something other domino would have to fall in order to get, get him to come back. So uh, I'm sure they're trying, but I think like a lot of teams, they're saying, okay, we're going to take our time. We're not, we're, you know, the, we're not going to rush to judgment right now. We're going to take our time and find a way to make it work. I think that's frustrating for a guy like Kadri, but um, it, it's one of those things that, you know, we're going to see this year and, and guys, we're going to see it again next year. It's the following year where we may see that rate rise in the cap, maybe as much as $10 million that gives a little bit, a lot more relief to a lot of general managers. Uh, speaking of being in trouble, how much are the Calgary flames in right now with uh, a qualifying offer unsigned uh, or signed by, by uh, Matthew Kachuk um, that would mean an unrestricted free agency season beginning next year, not this coming year, but the one after. Uh, is this the exit plan for Matthew Kachuk to get to unrestricted free agency at the age of 25? Is this a way for him to hit a home run with a contract with the Flames? But a, a lot of people are thinking it's the former, that he just wants out, and this is his quickest way to get there. Well, for, first of all, Matthew's pretty rich already. And all we know now is in the next 12 months, he's going to be that much richer. Uh, one way or the other, he's going to get his money. One way or the other. Yeah. yeah. One yeah. way or the other, he's going to From get Calgary his money. Calgary or somebody else? Well, Calgary or St. Louis. You know, and, and, and yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, those were all the rumors are he wants to play in St. Louis. He wants to play at home. Um, so you, you look at that and you say, well, you know, that's that's the smart move to make is, you know, don't wor- don't go to arbitration. Don't waste the time going to arbitration. Um, and you know, let's, let's do the, let's do the one year and, and see what happens. And it, it, you know, the, if, if there's something that the flames can do, uh, to keep him happy, uh, in the next 12 months. And, you know, I, I think the obvious one would say, well, what if Kadri went there? But I mean, if Kadri isn't there by now, I don't know why he isn't there by now. So maybe that would have helped Kachuk decide to stay. But perhaps this has been part of the plan all along. Perhaps That's this right. has been just just like I believe it's been part of the plan of Johnny Goodrow all along was he was going to go home or he would, let me put it this way, he was going to go to the United States. He always was going to go to the United States. Um, and it's not a knock at Calgary. It's not a knock at Canada, but he's an American and he wants to play in the United States. And I can respect that. And he's, and by the way, uh, in, in, under the collective bargaining agreement, he has earned that right to do that. So, and, and Matthew Kachuk has earned that right, uh, as of next year. So, so we'll have to wait and see. It's a tough time in Calgary. It's a tough time for Brad for living. Uh, when you consider, uh, how close they think they were last season, uh, only to be derail- derailed by their arch rival, uh, on it with a team that could have easily, I think, uh, given Colorado a bit more, 
of a uh, a challenge than the Oilers did in the conference final. I keep going back to that. Uh, I like Brad personally. I feel bad for him. I mean, yeah. although I would think that you'd you'd have to have heard whispers if you're Brad. You're you'd have to have heard whispers of any plans or discontent from a player that he had to have known this was a possibility at the very least. Don't you think? Yeah, but they're never going to admit that. I no, mean, I mean, no. I mean, the 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 conversations and listen. Uh, professional reputations are always at stake, both for for all for all three levels, guys, for the manager, for the player, and for the agent. Uh, and and there's no way that uh, uh, that Lewis Gross wanted to embarrass the Calgary Flames. Johnny Goodrow did not want to embarrass the Calgary Flames, so they they put it in a, in terms that uh, everybody could understand or felt they could understand. Brad. At his press conference the night before the, the free agency began, and put it in terms that a lot of people could understand, and life goes on, and and I, I you know as well as I do, Blake, I think that Brad had, was probably planning for that moment for a couple of weeks, and was trying to figure out how to manage his money in order to try to make it better, you, you know, uh, you know, and there are there are some. There are some strange things that happen on free agency day. I think that we, I think that a lot of people would look at a few of the deals and say, gosh, that was, why would he do that now? Why, you know, I like the one that really confused me was the Andre Palat to New Jersey. Andre Palat, uh, I mean, was there a, was there a rule that said you ha- had to sign on the first day? I don't think so. And uh, that to me was as interesting a signing as any. And I think that I, I think that Calgary, Calgary has, and Brad's always been aggressive. You know that, and, and there's no thing, no reason to think that he won't continue to be aggressive. When you say interesting on Palat, from the player's perspective, like, do you think he yeah. should have played the market P- much better? There's, you know, there. Where's the deadline to sign players? There is no deadline. <laughs> opening you know, night. You know, opening night. You know, maybe the first day of camp. Take your time. You know, Andre Palats. The, the, listen, you guys know this as well as I do. There are there are players now, and maybe Miller's one of them. Uh, and there, but there are other players on other teams that have more value now than they did before free agency started because teams feel the need to go and try to that they didn't get anybody, so now they have to try to find a way to get it. Now, how do they how do they get that scoring winger or how do they get that versatile player that can play center and wing? You know, there there's some fascinating stories and, and every, the rush to judgment to sign everybody on January or July 13th is shocking to me. It makes no sense at times. Um so and is it, is I, Lou Lamorello just slow playing the, the market here? Or I don't know if you saw the great headline on uh, the back page of Newsday the other day, the silence of the lamb, but it does kind of feel like the Islanders are just sitting this one out this year. And it, it makes me wonder, like, is Lane Lambert a miracle worker? And and like, I, what are the Islanders doing, do you think? That is, that is one of the best questions going right now. Now, they have some cap issues, let's face it. You know, it, it, you know the Islanders in Philadelphia – uh, put themselves in a really tough spot uh, in order to try to go out and sign one of the high-end free agents. Um, you know, Lou's got it. Lou's, Lou's in a tough spot, but I, I thought Lou would be much more aggressive than he has been. But then again, it's only middle of July. And last I checked, people don't go to camp for what? How many days is it? Like 65 days to camp? I mean, it's not that long. Or, or it's a lot longer than people realize, and and you can go and you can go and find bodies between now and then. And I think that that's what's going to happen. That's why I think this is going to be one of those summers where there's a signing a week, a trade a week. <laughs> you know, it's going to people are going to just keep tweaking their rosters in order to be ready for for a training camp. Gosh, looking at the Islanders, not only do they have just the number problem for for the cap, but they've got the age problem that yep. a lot of the guys they're eating up their cap. My goodness, they're an old team. Like they've got so many guys with a three that starts with their age and twenty uh, nine year olds too. Like my God, that is an old old team making a lot of money. Well, and the frustration for Islander fans is is that a couple of years ago they had two good defensemen in Devon Taves and Nick Letty. Yeah, uh, and they both had to get traded because of cap issues, and the and the team got older, older and slower. 
Um, and that reflected in the way they played last year. Uh, and last I checked, Letty just signed a long-term deal in St. Louis and the other guy won the Stanley cup. So, uh, it's, it, it's, it, 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 that's, and that's the bind that Lou is in right now. And he has to find a way to get out of it. Um, because there are, you know, a, a good BC boy, Matt Barzell has got to find a way to be happy there, uh, because he's the, he's the key to success for the Islanders in so many ways. But, uh, if they don't surround him with better players, uh, we're going to be talking about Matt Barzell at a certain point. Like we talked about Matthew Kachuk. Let me ask you this. Um, speaking of problems, who would you rather have in your team, Pierre-Luc Dubois or Patrick Laine? Oh God. You're asking me what kind of disease do I want? Um, <laughs> and that's, and that's not fair. Cause I, I I've seen both play and I've seen both play well. Um, uh, Quite frankly, I, I I mean, with Pat, what Pat Brisson told the uh, the French media uh, over the weekend that Dubois is interested in playing in Montreal, that's disheartening for Winnipeg. Uh, I do think Patrick Laine likes playing in Columbus. I do think Patrick Laine is thrilled that Johnny Goudreau is coming. Uh, I would not be surprised uh, to see Patrick Laine sign long term in Columbus. They're certainly hopeful of that. Uh, so I think there's a bigger upside for what Line A can do in Columbus right now than what Dubois is doing in Winnipeg. If you're the Montreal Canadiens, you're probably voting Dubois because he certainly sounds like he wants to be there, and he'd yeah. probably be a happy camper okay, there, right? So, but, but really, really, or is, or two well, years, maybe, maybe. two, year, two yeah. years later, yeah. when he's mad at Martin Saint Louis, he wants to be traded again. Right. This is not a, yeah, this maybe. is not good for his reputation. This is not. Also, this is not. This is not the way. And and. And Pat, I, Pat Brisson is one of the best agents around. Um, but there's obviously a level of exasperation of what's gone on and what's going on and what kind of money's expected. Also, John, he's just not special enough of a player to be making these sorts of demands. He's a nice player, but he's not that special. He's sort of acting like uh, the whole world wants him. I think that's a really good point. You know, the, the, and I think the biggest difference between those two guys is that, uh, and we've all witnessed it over the years, is that we've seen Patrick Laine be a game changer. And yeah. Dubois has, as good as he can be, as influential as he can be, he's not really a game changer. And that, to me, is the biggest difference. And, and as again, it goes back to, like, what happens if two years from now he's not happy in Montreal? This is not a, this is not a good look for him. Speaking of not a good look, before we let you go, uh, Hockey Canada... It looks like they are in a boatload of uh, trouble right now. Uh, they've got the government breathing down their neck, and needless to say, there's the health and welfare of uh, of a young woman that is, uh, you know, at stake potentially here with the allegations against uh, a handful and a bit of players from the 2018 team. Mm -hmm. The players that weren't involved are coming out of the woodwork because they're sick and tired of their name even being you know, attached to it in some way, shape or form. So they're saying, Hey, if no one's going to make it clear that we weren't involved, I wasn't there. Uh, that list is growing, meaning the process of elimination is getting easier and easier. Where does this story end? I, I don't see a tidy resolution coming anytime soon. Well, um, let's hope the whole truth comes out. Um, you, you know, and, and did hockey Canada in, uh, in earnest try to, do what it it could to to protect uh, the victim, um, and was it really allowed to? It you know were, were the people there allowed to communicate with the police properly? I, I think that there has to be a whole list of uh, uh, of accounts, like of what should happen and how it should happen. Um, but I don't think it's over with Hockey Canada. Uh, I think what we're going to find, too, is that the National Hockey League, if any of those players that were involved, if they be, if it becomes public, uh, I think the NHL is going to inflict uh, a great deal of discipline on it as well because they don't want it to reflect bad on not just necessarily just the game of hockey, but the National Hockey League. Uh, thank you for this. Enjoy your week. Uh, have a, a great start to the, the true offseason. I think we're going to talk to you next week, though, right? I'll be here. Because, because I guarantee you, he's had a trade, I, I guarantee, trade a week. I guarantee yeah. you there's going to be a trade a week and a signing a week. <laughs> I, I sound, like, right. I sound okay. like one of those used car guys on Broadway. <laughs>
You know, buy my car. <laughs> buy my car. <laughs> hey, I'll sign up in our business. I'll sign up for a trade a week for the remainder of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. We need something. <laughs> that keeps us going. Uh, thank you for this, Thanks, John. John. We'll talk soon. Cheers. John Shannon from the Bob McCown podcast, longtime NHL hockey executive, NHL uh, hockey television executive. Um, and uh, hey, a busy, busy summer already. And I, I don't disagree with him. I think it's a it's a slow IV drip of hockey news for the rest of the summer. The cadre one is interesting though, and and John's right. Like he doesn't need a deal in place until training camp, but how many teams are truly in on him? And if others go elsewhere, you know, does his market evaporate? And he's got to be banking on the fact that, no, that there's going to be a market for a player like him coming off the season that he just had. But, you know, that's what makes this all so fascinating is uh, the whole supply and demand. And uh, I don't know, my, my gut tells me that the longer it goes uh, behind the scenes, Colorado is trying to make some things happen to retain him. But, uh, you know, how much do they want to touch the championship team that they assembled last year? And obviously he's a big part of, but. You know how long, how far is too far in terms of making moves just to bring back this one player? Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of uh, pros and cons lists being drawn up. I think for the Vancouver Canucks and other teams as well, saying, "Well, we could do this, but it comes with this consequence." So we'll see what the summer looks like.